Your reaction to what's happened in the English Channel today? Well, obviously, it is shocking. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I, like you, I think this was always going to happen. It's been a tragedy that's been pending for a very long time. Um, and it's all very well to talk about declaring this as an emergency situation. We've had an emergency now um, for a, a very long time indeed. Uh, and I've been saying for 20 years that the only way we're going to be able to deal with this is to remove the magnet that draws people here when they're already in a perfectly safe country. Uh, and that magnet is that uh, people think that if they get into Britain, they're very, very unlikely to be removed. I mean, after all, if you're in a perfectly safe country like France and you're genuinely fleeing persecution, uh, then the logical thing to do is to apply for asylum in France. Uh, but for many years now, it's nothing new about this. The channel crossings are newish, but there's nothing new about the principle. Um, for many years now, uh, people have been trying in places like St. Gat um, to get into Britain unlawfully uh, rather than uh, to apply for asylum where they are. So you've got to ask what the magnet is. And the magnet is that people reckon that once they get here, it's one of the easiest countries in the West to disappear if they think their claims are going to be turned down. Uh, we don't practice detention. We have no national identity cards. We do have a flourishing black economy. It's very, very easy to disappear. Yes, it is. And even if you do go through the process of applying for asylum and get rejected, as was the case with the Liverpool bomber, um, even when, you're, when you get rejected, you don't get removed. So you're absolutely right about that magnet. And I just would invite you to say a few words. I know it was the funeral services this week of Sir David Amos, who was a very good friend of yours. And, and I know that you spoke on behalf of the family at the funeral. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, there were two events. There was a civic service in Southend, uh, where I simply read out a statement on behalf of the family uh, saying that they were shattered. The exact words of uh, Julia, the widow, uh, were that uh, the family was broken, uh, but also saying that they wanted good to, to come from it um, and that uh, uh, they wanted peace uh, and greater tolerance to come from it. And yesterday, I felt very strongly, because yesterday was the actual funeral in Westminster Cathedral, uh, I felt very strongly that we should all try and ensure that David is not just remembered for the way he died, but that he'll be remembered for the way he lived and for what he achieved in his lifetime. If I can draw an analogy, Nigel, think of Airy Neve. If you say Airy Neve, everybody immediately thinks, oh, yes, he was the MP who was blown up by the yeah. IRA in the House yeah. of Commons car park. In fact, he'd made the first home run from Holders. He'd played a major part uh, in the war crimes trials. Uh, he was a very big man, but all anybody thinks about is how he died. I don't want that to happen for David. No, understandable. And thank you for sharing those thoughts with us. Now, you have been observing and involved in Conservative Party politics and Conservative thinking for quite a number of years. And you've watched Conservative leaders come and go and you've praised some and you've damned others. How does Boris Johnson now look as a leader and how do you assess his position? Is he in control of his own parliamentary party? Can he bounce back? How do you see it, Anne? I think he may well be able to bounce back because that is part of being Boris. Boris bounces. Uh, but if you look back to the original Boris, to the Boris who became prime minister, uh, who was so confident in what he was doing, um, was so buccaneering, if you like, prepared to take risks, uh, that he ordered all those vaccines, you know, way, way ahead of the EU, got Britain into a really good position of being ahead of everybody else, took maximum advantage of Brexit to be able to do that. Uh, and uh, that was Boris going for it. And the big thing is he actually ordered so many of those vaccines before they were even approved. I mean, this was Boris, Boris at his determined best. But I think getting COVID actually had a much greater effect on him than, than people realise. He now appears to be all over the place. Um, that buccaneering uh, attitude has gone. Uh, and one feels that instead of being in charge of events, he's now being blown about by events. Yeah, I, I have to say, I rather agree with that. It's sort of almost more like followership than it is leadership. I wondered, when he shuffled his notes and said, forgive me three times, a couple of years ago, he'd have laughed that off. And I, I just wondered whether perhaps he might have just lost his confidence a little bit. I'm sure he has lost his confidence, and I'm pretty certain also that it was down to COVID. 
Um, and, uh, you know, she was suddenly hit by this massive national emergency that nobody had foreseen, a global emergency for that matter. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I think he was quite badly knocked off course. Uh, and I think his confidence has taken a knock. Now, as I say, Bar Boris is very, very capable of bouncing back, but he's in trouble at the moment. And yep. I think this is a time for thinking. And I don't think enough thought uh, uh, comes out of number 10. Uh, for example, the migrant situation that we talked about, you know, that all you get is umpteen initiatives announced, which are never actually followed through. None of them happen. And a tendency to blame everybody else except ourselves. Well, we're responsible for who arrives on our shores. Come on. Yeah, no, and we're the magnet. And as you said at the very start of this, thank you, Anne Whittacombe, for joining us and sharing your thoughts with us here at GB News today. Thank you.